So just a one second preface. Um, it's strange a little bit to speak here. I've been hearing a lot of um, discussion of epistemology, good discussion of epistemology, analytic philosophy, and I'm going to be talking largely about uh, Ricoeur and some other philosophers, including Hannah Arendt. And, you know, Arendt is <laughs> only English by contingency, in a sense, and, and, you know, by fault of history or something. And so, you know, it's not going to sound much like a lot of what we've heard, but at least the, the paper we heard uh, this morning maybe is a little bit closer. So it's a warning. In numerous essays on the seemingly unclassifiable works of Hannah Arendt, Paul Ricoeur attempted to articulate what he perceived to be a common thread running through her entire oeuvre. That is, both those works reputed to be more concerned with specifically political or historical questions, as well as those that have a more philosophical tenor. The guiding thread, Ricoeur suggests, can be put in the form of a question. Comment l'homme est-il possible? How is human being possible? This question might seem utterly superfluous, for surely there are human beings. We might attempt a proof in the style of G. E. Moore. Here's a human being, there's a human being. Another, another. But this answer doesn't really get to the heart of the question, for what constitutes a human being is far from evident. Thus, Ricoeur sees in Arendt's work a recourse to a philosophical anthropology of the trans-historical capacities that give human beings their specific dignity. This is made necessary in light of the almost complete plasticization of human capability, in, particularly, in particular, sorry, the capacity for evil, though I'm not sure whether it's a capacity or a liability a, 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 to err, a, it's, it's not entirely clear, but Arendt summed it up in this shocking phrase borrowed from David Rousset, who had himself amended a famous expression of Dostoevsky, everything is possible. How, Ricoeur asked, can this idea stemming from Arendt's first major work, with the not insignificantly Darwinian sounding title, The Origins of Totalitarianism, be related to the work that comes after? What he sees as connecting the, the works is the notion, or rather the imperative, to discern a philosophical anthropology. In the face of totalitarian experiences where human beings are rendered superfluous, something like possible corpses and their correlate, actual murderers, there comes a need for rearticulating an anthropology that would serve to ground the possibility of human being and uh, therefore a non-totalitarian world. These are linked. Now I would like to pause here for a moment and underscore an absence which I find rather intriguing. You can go a long time reading English language philosophy without ever coming across the notions of superfluous man, totalitarianism, and radical or banal evil. Indeed, it is almost entirely unlikely that most of what for a time went under the heading of analytical philosophy would bother to address these things at all. I do not mean this simply as a critical rejoinder, but as a way of underlining that this problem just doesn't appear within their orbit of urgent questions. Under the dubious protection of an unthinkably potent nuclear umbrella, English language philosophers by and large allowed the epistemological gaze to become more or less hegemonic. However, even within the strictures of an epistemology that often smacks of scientism, what was of concern and even great importance to many English language philosophers is the Darwinian idea of the origin of species. In this way, there is, at least negatively, within the resources of analytic philosophy itself, an answer to the question of the possibility of the human being. The answer, the human being is a product of nature. Or, to put it even more bluntly, quoting Quine, we are physical denizens of the physical world, full stop. Thus, we can discern in contemporary philosophical anthropology, broadly speaking, two very different tendencies. The first one, or I spoke about the second, attempts to naturalize anthropology and make it continuous with zoology and a generalized theory of organisms. This is the tendency most commonly adopted by dominant trends in English language philosophy. The other is to return to human beings their specific dignity, and even in some versions, and I apologize for the barbarism, to cosmotheologize anthropology a tendency fairly closely associated with what is often called phenomenology's theological turn. So in order to better understand this second, less well-known tendency, or perhaps less well-known, what I would like to do is turn from Ricoeur's general sense of Arendt's philosophical project as responsive to the threatened legitimacy of the human being, grounded in specific political events and a concrete history of human freedom, to a broader conception of what I take to be the same problem rather differently expressed. It is this extension in the direction of a theological affirmation of human goodness that I would like to bring to light. In a book published this year in France with the forceful title Le propre de l'homme sur une légitimité menacée, 
The phenomenologist and historian of philosophy, Rémi Bragg, poses an almost identical question as recurs Arendt, but he does so in a way that speaks more directly to the kind of naturalism prevalent in much English language philosophy. Bragg does not point to the totalian phenomena as the major cause of the problematization of the legitimacy of human beings. Instead, he refers to three important and related destinies. The first is a challenge to the coherence and comprehensiveness of the answer of Darwinian naturalism to the problem of anthropology. Bragg asks, did nature make man? If it did, then how can we explain the fact that nature, as it has been said by Günther Anders, incidentally the first husband of Hannah Arendt, how is it that nature produces a species that could consider destroying itself? Does this not, in fact, show the impossibility of seeing in this species a pure product of nature? If nature made man, then why did natural selection lead to the utility of producing nuclear weapons? A version of this question had, in fact, been asked by Arendt herself in an essay on Europe and the atom bomb. But what Bragg's analysis adds, echoing Anders, is the way that this renders the Darwinian explanation of the descent of man irrecusably problematic. The second related challenge stems from the thoroughgoing materialism emerging out of philosophies of the French Enlightenment, especially in the figure of Diderot, but just as well in people like Spinoza, or a certain Spinoza anyhow, not Ricoeur Spinoza perhaps. If every organ and every organic system, perhaps even orga non-organic ones, are equally individuals, and if the measure of happiness is the greatest flourishing of the greatest number of individuals, each with their own conative or desire to continue to exist, since as most people reasonably reasonably, sorry, most reasonable people believe planetary scale crises like climate change are anthropogenic, that is, since humans have caused and continue to cause such imminent threats to the planet that their activities are leading to the destruction of the biosphere itself, then is it not the most responsible choice for man to enact his own demise through a refusal of procreation? This notion of willed extinction is not merely the dream of a lunatic fringe, but has many vocal proponents. Indeed, one of the most recent examples is David Benatar, whose book, Better Never to Have Been, a work cited by Prague, was published by a press no less reputable than that of Oxford University. The third of these threats to the legitimacy of the continuation of human existence, and the most controversial, as well as the most important for our purposes, is the last. Atheistic or agnostic humanism has resulted, in Bragg's analysis, in the cul-de-sac of anti-humanism, most famously that of Michel Foucault, where no answer can be given to the question of what man is good for or why man should be. To this last, Bragg gives his most uncompromising response. Without faith in a god at once the creator and provider, analogical to the god of medieval philosophy, man's existence loses its legitimacy. He explains, for the person traveling by foot, as for the driver, the most reasonable thing to do when you reach a cul-de-sac is to turn around. Thus, we must revise our judgment on medieval cosmology and see in its connection of creation and providence the indispensable condition for the pursuit of a human adventure. And here he suggests that we must replace the agnostic humanist notion of a project, so essential to recur and Arendt, no less than Heidegger and Sartre, with that of a task. And I think task is meant differently in the sense that uh, Professor Taylor uh, invoked in his question. Bragg cites the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 28. In the other source of our culture, he says, the Bible, man appears as the creature of a personal god. The domination of nature is not a project, but a task, an ergon in Aristotle's sense. At this point, it is good to recall how this question was answered by Ricoeur's Arendt. After pointing to the terroristic thesis that everything is possible, he remarks that any response doit reposer sur l'hypothèse d'une constitution de la nature humaine justifiée par la capacité d'ouvrir. Is this, he asks, un retour à une anthropologie philosophique dépassée? Non. La preuve de cette anthropologie philosophique serait la politique elle-même. The question that Bragg raises and the answer he provides is that such an anthropology, based in politics or what he calls la création de soi par soi, is simply not enough, for it results in a circular absurdity. Far from uncritically endorsing Bragg's solution of a return to a pre-modern anthropology, what I would like to do in what follows is take, seriously, take it seriously and see in his formulation of the challenge to the legitimacy of the human at least a complement to that which Ricoeur finds in Arendt. Beginning with a brief summary of classical philosophical anthropology, which always at the same time assumes a certain cosmology, I'll proceed to look at what sort of response we might be able to find to Bragg's suggestion 
in the philosophical anthropology of Arendt or, and Ricoeur as well, especially the Arendt that emerges from Ricoeur's reading. I'll conclude by pointing towards some resources in Arendt and Ricoeur that might serve to bring a rapprochement between the strong position articulated by Bragg and their own seemingly more modest and poetic reconciliations between man or human being and the universe. We are all familiar with Plato's ironical definition of man as a featherless biped. While at first glance this definition seems to say very little, coupling a negative criterion, featherlessness, with a positive one referring to a stature or manner of progression, that is of local motion, both features of this definition have given birth to extraordinarily fruitful progenies. Thus, from featherlessness has come the notion, much underscored in Aristotle and his successors, that man is the naked animal. Jean-Louis Chrétien has attempted to revive the import of this definition, pointing to this nudity of the human being, which marks it as a being essentially exposed, stripped of all the adornment and protections afforded to other animals, something that is most readable in the stark nakedness of the newborn in their first appearance, a being who is handed over without any protection to the perils and menaces of the world. Nudity here has to do with being seen, but being seen without protection. Thus, what human featherlessness suggests is the poverty of the human being. On the other hand, this nudity is also the source of man's richness. Chrétien recalls a passage from one of Aristotle's so-called biological treatises, Parts of Animals. Les autres animaux n'ont chacun qu'un seul moyen de défense, et il n'est pas possible de le changer pour un autre. Mais ils sont forcés, pour ainsi dire, de garder leurs chaussures pour dormir et pour faire n'importe quoi d'autre, et ne doivent jamais déposer l'armure qu'ils ont autour de leur corps, ni, ch ni changer l'arme qu'ils ont reçue en partage. Thus, there is an overdetermination of animal function already operative at the level of morphology. The other aspect of Plato's definition, man's rectitude, has an even more important consequence. Not only does the erect status free up the hand, allowing it to become the almost unlimited possibility which Aristotle referred to as the instrument of instruments, and which Anaxagoras had already used to define man, the being with hands, the erect stature has another more important element. This has to do with what must seem to modern ears to be among the most archaic elements of Aristotle's philosophy, that is, his sense of cosmic directions. Man's rectitude conforms to his nobility because by standing up, he places the highest part of himself, noose, a part in which no other terrestrial creature shares, in closest proximity with those things that are best, hoi cretones, the heavenly bodies. It is because the highest element in man must be raised up as high as possible, that is to say, the part of man that is entirely free of contamination by earthiness, and which participates in the eternity of the heavenly bodies, ought to be brought closest to them, with whom it shares its eternal being. We can go on and on interminably with these rather anachronistic and seemingly unscientific definitions. They were a particular favorite of the medievals, and their deployment was almost always in the name of asserting and defending the stature of man prior to his anti-penultimate humiliation in the loss of the geocentric worldview, the last two humiliations being, in Freud's famous reckoning, Darwinian evolutionary theology, and Freud's own discovery of the unconscious. Bragg likes to cite as an example one of the epistles of the Brethren of Purity, a group that was active in Basra circa 950, where the question of the legitimacy of animal sacrifice and man's domination of nature generally is played out in a trial between human beings and animals presided over by the king of the jinns. Such questions had already been raised in classical antiquity with Pythagorean abstention from meat, as in Porphyry's treatment on abstinence and the interlinking of human and animal life through the transmigration of souls. What one finds in all of these philosophical anthropologies that follow in the wake of Aristotle is that they adopt, at least for the purposes of disputation, his cosmological, his cosmological standpoint, that is, his sense that man is the terrestrial being that, in the highest degree, conforms to the cosmos. Man is, in the most literal sense, the universal animal. Now, this should not be confused with the thesis that the human being is the highest being that there is. In his ethics, Aristotle makes very clear that this is not the case, something both Arendt and Bragg never cease to stress. Nevertheless, the philosopher gives a certain privilege to human beings because biological reality is most manifest, emphanestaton, in man. The Renaissance of Aristotelian philosophy in the 13th century saw another flourishing of these attempts at definition, more often than not by clarifying the relative rights of animals, men, and angels. The anthropologies of the 19th century bear witness to yet another renaissance of such definition, no longer encumbered by Aristotle, though thus, sorry, silent about the cosmological connection, 
as did the 1920s at the instigation of Max Scheler, for whom being labile was a defining feature of humanity. The essence of man, says Scheler, is his indefiniteness. In his posthumously published work, Beschreibung des Menschen, Hans Blumenberg has given a fairly exhaustive list of these modern attempts at definition. And you'll be happy to hear that I've excised my top 10 from, from this version of the paper. But as Blumenberg points out, these definitions they don't really tell us very much about man at all, except perhaps that when gathered together in the kind of topographical analysis he prefers, what I call far reading in distinction from close reading, they attest to two basic forms of definition. Either man is defined as a rich creature or man is defined as a poor creature. Thus, as Ricoeur said in a slightly different context, the thematics of poros penia are irreducible. The fact that man is not fixed biologically to a specific environment, that he has the seasons in himself, as it were, that he is the only creature who can be bestial, all of these can be understood either as a fundamental lack of proper equipment, as in the definition by George Simmel, man is the being of inept means, that is to say, man lacks instincts to take care of all that befalls him, or it can signify richness, as openness to the fullness of a world that is no longer accentuated only in terms of vital necessities. For Blumenberg, in either case, what this means is that anthropology is linked fundamentally with rhetoric, the lexus of political praxis par excellence. To say man is poor is to say he does not and cannot possess the truth, and therefore needs rhetoric in order to persuade. To say man is rich is to say that though he does possess the truth, the indeterminacy with which he is endowed allows him to rhetorically flourish the truth and thereby to make it, as Cicero said, accessible and impressive, thus appropriate to its object. This correlation between anthropology and rhetoric has important implications for the style of discourse of philosophical anthropology itself, as we shall see. What I've wanted to do in bringing the natural biological element of all anthropology into relief is set the stage for what will become an axial sub-question to my main question about the condition of legitimacy of philosophical anthropology. Do the philosophical anthropologies of Ricoeur and Arendt leave open the possibility for any dialogue with biology and cosmology, or even with the kind of cosmobiology familiar to Greek and medieval philosophers alike? I think the answer, at least at first glance, is no. Let us see why. The most emphatic and explicit refusal is not in Ricoeur's works, as we might expect in Tony Rassi, where the question of the intermingling of the time of the world or cosmological time and the time of the soul or phenomenological time is posed most explicitly. In those volumes, especially the third, Ricoeur takes for granted that these discourses occlude each other and require for their coordination certain practical mediations or connectors provided by, or at least assumed in, the historiographical operation, namely the calendar, the notion of a generation with the threefold temporal division borrowed from Alfred Schutz of contemporaries, predecessors, and successors, and the triad, documents, monuments, archives, which he sometimes collects under the heading of the trace. What each of these connectors indicates is the always indirect character of the intermingling of human and cosmological time. Even the notion of a generation tied to the biological facts of reproduction and replacement is not treated as such by Ricoeur more in terms of its social character, in terms of the sharing of memories and know-how broadly construed. In fact, these connectors have in a sense always been present in his work in the notions of language, tools, and institutions by which he characterized the durable work world from the very beginning. We might also say that Ricoeur here is very close to Arendt's own descriptions of the world of artifice erected by Homo Faber. In both philosophers, what is exceedingly evident is their refusal to connect this notion of erecting a world with what both would consider the mere biological fact of man's stature of being erect. In fact, uh, in Anne Mee's presentation, she used the expression merely biological life, referring to Ricoeur. And it seems that we only ever talk about biology in Ricoeur with saying that just biological, merely biological, or rent as well, it seems to me. This differs, as we saw, from previous anthropologies, which had always linked the stature of man in both senses with the freeing up of his hand, which is, of course, the condition of possibility of the extension of nature, as Aristotle understands techne or art, in that most important second book of his physics, thus always referring to a biological criterion. Before turning to his earliest and most explicit discussion of the relationship between cosmology and philosophical anthropology, for which the notion of freedom is a defining feature, that is, in his doctoral thesis, which then became the first volume of his trilogy on the philosophy of the will, 
It is helpful to see in some of the opuscula written around the same period a number of important breaks and returns that recur things are essential. I have selected one of these almost at random, although I could have chosen many others. In La Sexualité, La Merveille, L'Errance, L'Enigme, which first appeared in Esprit, the cosmo-vital notion of sacred eros is given a kind of Hegelian-style phenomenological historical treatment. Beginning with the interlinking of cosmic cycles with fertility, there is an understanding of desire, and especially sexual desire, with its fecundity in unbroken continuity with the vegetal and the celestial, the cosmo-vital notion of the sacred, in which human reproduction is linked <coughs> with the great rhythms of vegetal life, a whole network of correspondence which was able to connect sex to life and death to food, the seasons, plants, animals, and gods. This is destroyed with the advent of Christianity and the anti-life tendencies Nietzsche has so dramatically described. Now, in this essay, Ricoeur seeks to reconstruct a sense of the sacred based on the fragile alliance of the spiritual and carnal in the person. He thus proceeds through an examination of the institution of marriage, extending it beyond the biopolitical, always beyond, right, the biopolitical function of social or species continuation, while at the same time refraining from simply attempting return to the naive unity of the cosmo-vegetal. The theme of the person and mutual personalization is foreign to the cosmic liturgy of vegetative sacredness and the invitation it extends to individuals to lose themselves in the flux of generations and regenerations, since procreation remains fundamentally irresponsible, hazardous animal. But concomitant with the rise of the naturalism we referred to at the beginning comes a waning of prohibitions which serve to depersonalize arrows to the point that it becomes something that we other mammals engage in as well. Even still, Recur maintains, eroticism remains mysterious. We have the vivid and yet obscure feeling that sex participates in a network of powers whose cosmic harmonies are forgotten but not abolished, that life is much more than life, universal, everything and everyone, and that sexual joy makes us participate in this mystery of plunging into the river of life. Recur ends this essay on this note of mystery. Even where eros has been integrated into institutions and techniques of the body, sexuality maintains its non-instrumental immediacy. Thus, even when institutionalized, it always remains in between the restlessness of desire and the sclerosis of perverse constancy. I refer to this essay in particular, though as I said, I could have cited others, because it seems to me to come closest to a tone Ricoeur only sparingly adopts, a tone quite different from that taken in his thesis, which, for my purposes here, will represent his most important statement on cosmology and its relation to the self understood phenomenologically. I do not intend to try and sort out and make consonant what might seem to be dissonances between these two statements, nor do I want to try and attribute the more daring statements of the opuscule to any kind of aberrance on the part of a young Ricoeur. It is only to point to an openness and thus to excuse the admittedly rather bizarre terrain on which I am traversing in this reflection on anthropology guided by Ricoeur's lifelong concerns. My sense is that he maintained this openness to the very end, and we witness it very strikingly in the enigmatic fragments gathered together and published by Catherine Goldenstein under the heading of Life, of Living, Vivant. Changing tones rather dramatically, let us now attend to Ricoeur's thesis itself. I am especially interested in the section which directly precedes the second part of Le Volontaire, L'Involontaire on action, voluntary motion, and the powers, the last section of part one, where he takes up the question of the possibility of a definition of freedom in the margins of cosmology. That is, a discourse in which persons and things are both determined in a common system. At issue is a choice regarding how to approach the question of the will. If we begin from a cosmology which places the undetermined will under the determinateness of the infinite, we thus make the will into a species of the genus desire, which tends naturally towards its end, and is stamped with the adjective rational insofar as this desire obeys the command. Ricoeur categorically rejects such an approach as an unacceptable general cosmology, for it cannot contain a veritable subject, but only a received power which masks the subject by right away attaching it to the entire order of nature. Indetermination of the will must not, recur asserts, stem from a more fundamental determination with respect to the absolute good. It is rather in the first movement of deliberation that the self is determined by the self, and it is in this sense that he insists responsibility must appear without a basis, alone. Rejecting what is here presented as a Thomas cosmology, but which follows precisely in outline the Aristotelian cosmological doctrines with which we began, our survey, Ricoeur adds that the only possibility for reappropriating classical cosmologies within the general limitations of phenomenology, for which such cosmologies necessarily appear as outgrowths of the ease and permanence of the natural attitude, 
is to articulate a formal ontology which would be the sum of determinations of the idea of object of thought in general. In this way, the concepts of being, reality, possibility, object, relation, though they participate in common fields of meaning, must also be said to belong in their material specificity to different regional ontologies such as being as nature and being as consciousness. This refusal to contaminate the concepts of one regional ontology with another leads to the most succinct statement of his rejection of classical cosmology. Aristotelian cosmology is a mixture of regions with each other and with formal ontology. This is how a fantasy physics is born, loaded with diminished subjective concepts which in turn engulf consciousness within a sort of general nature. What I would like to maintain from these refusals is not only the difference in tone from the more fluid movement between life understood cosmologically and life qua human life that we saw in the essay on sexuality, but also and especially this notion that the self is determined by the self. We have seen it before in Bragg's replacement of the notion of project for that of task and the notion of the self-givenness of man as an impossible position in light of the cul-de-sac of an at least methodologically speaking agnostic humanism and its twin anti-humanism. We will return to this in our concluding remarks. In order to see another version of this at least methodologically agnostic philosophical anthropology, one directly refuted by Bragg, I would like to turn to Ricoeur's rather tendentious reading of Arendt. Now, to call it tendentious is not to derogate it, but to see in what sense Ricoeur very productively and I think appropriately reads Arendt against herself. Hannah Arendt makes two explicit disavowals in the first dozen pages of Vita Activa, which is the German edition of Human Condition. The first is, in fact, the very first sentence of that edition, a sentence which does not appear in the English original. Arendt insists that this book will expressly not, ausdrücklich nicht, talk about man, the earth, the cosmos, or being as such. Whether the book, in fact, succeeds in discussing these things is something her doctor father, Karl Jaspers, was doubtful of, and he did not mind telling her. They formed what he called the atmosphere of the entire book. Ricoeur clearly agreed with Jaspers, for when he wrote the preface for the French translation, he treated the book explicitly as a philosophical anthropology, thus violating Arendt's own restriction that she would not address dimension, <coughs> since for her, the pro project of philosophical anthropology is impossible. Noting that saying what man is is something only God could do, and anyways, the question is irrelevant because it poses the question of man as a what, and not as a who, which is his most importantly human aspect. That is, the possibility that one could become the subject of a biography. To have lived is to have lived a human life, a bios that was agathos or kakos, good or bad, and not just life, same. This is what Arendt means when she says that the problem of human nature seems unanswerable in its general, general philosophical sense, for to do so would be to speak about a who as though it were a what. But there is a slippage from this blanket refusal, and Ricoeur is well aware of this. It is already present in the notion of the as such that my title indicates, the discursive grounding for statements of the type, men are beings who, who are, all the same in such a way that nobody is ever the same, or in the analysis of the conditions under which life has been given to man, that is, the sum total of human capacities and activities. Arendt does note here the specificity of philosophical discourse in distinction from the sciences, anthropology, psychology, biology, etc., which also concern themselves with man. Ricoeur, as we have seen, and in many other places, most explicitly by my lights in his 1988 World Congress of Philosophy address entitled The Human Being is the Subject Matter of Philosophy, stresses the unique generality of philosophical discourse and its particular suitability to address the question of man. In a way, paralleling the Aristotelian definition as, the most, as man as the most general or universal animal, philosophy can be seen to be the most general kind of inquiry, not, as Rémi Bragg has stressed, in virtue of some specific competence, but precisely due to the specific incompetence of philosophy. In effect, philosophy has chosen for itself, as its only expertise, what is common to all, and as its only instrument, what all men know how to wield, language. So, having justified the controversial reading of Arendt's Vita Active as philosophical anthropology, let us turn to her ontics as unpacked by Ricoeur. In his preface, Ricoeur treats the triad of activities which, take up the v which make up the Vita Activa in terms of their characteristic time concepts, all the while showing how these concepts are ranked and the puzzling or paradoxical character of this ranking. So, for example, the highest human activity, so ranked for its being an end in itself, thus a highest intentional mode, a most perfect way of aiming, has as its characteristic temporality a sort of <coughs> bipolarity. Praxis, as the sharing of words and deeds, is at once frail, though not futile, like the metabolism with nature, that belongs to the laboring activity and to the human qua species being. At the same time, Praxis is the condition of possibility of a relative permanence, 
uh, an earthly immortality which is instoried and remembered. If you compare Arendt's notes on time concepts in her Denk Tagebuch, you find that certain things which me mediate between the cosmos or cosmological sense of time as eternal, cyclical, and unchanging, and the phenomenological political sense as unfolding in a line or a span between uh, birth and death. So, for example, she notes the notion of an Olympiad, and then moving forward, she talks about the foundation of Rome, which is further strengthened by the Christian notion of the calendar as beginning from an axial moment, the birth of Christ, the year zero, as it were, and the notion of a beginning is introduced into time, where the cosmos are now made to play second fiddle to the rectilinear sense of time, which is, in a sense, a biologizing of the calendar, the biology in a, in a funny sense. In other words, it is now made to coincide with the fact that, as Arendt was fond of saying, following the evangelist Luke, a child has been born unto us. The meaning for the relationship between cosmology and anthropology is crucial, whereas, for example, Plato, when he tells of the origins of cities, describes the earlier time as one of ground poles which are undone by catastrophe, thus always taking for granted that there is a no beginning of these revolutions, one finds in modern authors states of nature which precede any previous polis. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. The crucial notion for Arendt is permanence or eternity, Ricoeur recognizes. In her essay, The Concept of History, uh, she describes eternizing as a specific form of natural concern. If man is not a, uh, if man is not the highest being there is, if he is between the vegetal and astral, what kind of permanence is he capable of? Arendt's ontics offer their own response: species eternity, tool durability, or the relative immortality of organized remembrance. Which of these movements best corresponds to or approximates the eternity of the celestial bodies? Arendt tries to show how eternity of species only approximates it if we understand the astral sphere in the sense of pure presence and if we include the being of human beings as who what's. The same structure of and height disqualifies the durability of tools or human works. So what remains is the frail permanence of memory, though this frailty is only one-sided, since, as Arendt says, following a curious statement of Aristotle, uh, which in her judgment accords surprisingly well with Pericles, where virtue is, oblivion cannot enter. Okay, I'm just going to turn toward my conclusion. Um, in an English language review of Remy Bragg's Aristote et la question du monde, after celebrating the clarity of Bragg's argument and the importance of the anthropological data extracted in a Herculean effort from both the enormous corpus Aristotelicum as well as the commentary tradition, the reviewer asks a question which goes to the heart not only of Bragg's thought, but also that of Ricoeur, no less than Arendt, and in fact, it's quite close in a way to Strassen's complaint. It stems from an attempt to see in the Staggerite an anthropology which, as we have said, simply is not his, and thus stems from an emphasis that each in turn places on the unthought element in Aristotle's work. The question comes at the end of the review as a kind of rude shock. Is ipseity, as distinct from individuality, a religious artifact or relic, more specifically, a singularly Christian notion? Is the blind spot of Hellenism visible only from the perspective of attenuated revelation? This rather startling objection is, as far as I can see, more or less unproblematically dealt with by Bragg. But it's much more problematic for Arendt and Ricoeur, for whom the attempt to articulate their position is strictly agnostic. Though Ricoeur always refused to synthesize his phenomenology with a cosmology, um, his separation is, in a sense, even more dramatic in Arendt, for whom religious revelation was more or less unenlightening. The closest Arendt comes to explicitly affirming something like an albeit negative cosmology is in the epigraph of the German edition of The Human Condition, where she reproduces two stanzas from Bertolt Brecht's Choral Ode of Baal. Arendt doesn't interpret them there, but she does so elsewhere. The stanzas from Baal's Ode were meant to stand, for, stand in for the kind of action which befits a second rank being. This planet pleases Baal, if only because there is no other planet, Arendt writes. She continues, what matters is the sky, the sky that was there before man was and will be there after he is gone. So the best thing a man can do is to love what for a short time is his. And this Arendt deems appropriate to the kind of being man is, that is to say, a mortal for sharing the sky for a few moments allows for a more authentic relation to the sun, which rises and sinks with majestic indifference and shines over all living creatures. We are close here to the blind spot of Arendt's thought, where she does not dare to say with Aristotle, it is not politics that makes man, man is not the product of man and of the interactive life that he leads in the heart of the polis, 
Man has, from the very beginning, an extra-human origin. While it is true that man begets man, such begetting is only possible with the help of the sun. Anthropos, anthropon, gena, kai, helios. This possibility of an authentic relation to the sun, in other words, to the eternity of the cosmos with its sublime indifference, is precisely what we have seen, according to Ricoeur, allows Arendt to order and rank what I have called her human ontics. Is this merely a return to the pagan gods which requires a willful blindness toward modern science? In her defense, if that is the right word, it is not clear that Arendt means this in any way other than poetically, and in this sense she is rather close to Ricoeur for whom, as we have seen and as you all know, poetic mediation is in the last analysis the only recourse we have for coordinating freedom in nature. Does this mean that any attempt to forge an ontology of potency and actuality that would give a special status to human powers requires for its very legitimacy a reference to a creator god, not unlike the one whose voice can be heard, however indirectly, in the sacred books of what appears to some to be merely one tradition among many? It's hard to say. What is certain is that the translation of the notion of project, a notion so important to both recur and rent, into the notion of task, a translation which Bragg insists is necessary if we turn around from what he calls the cul-de-sac of agnostic humanism, uh, can only that can provide a non-trivial, non-circular response to the question, qui fait l'homme? This translation would require an enormous and perhaps impossible effort, one which we cannot attempt here anyway. Thank you.